Good evening and welcome to another edition of Mid-American Gardener. I'm your host and Master Gardener intern, Tanisha Shade Spain. We are live tonight, so hopefully we'll uh, get to hear from some of you on our calls. We've also got some show and tell items and a lot of things to get to. So let's just go ahead and jump right in and have our panelists introduce themselves and tell you a little bit more about what their specialties are. So Shane, we'll start with you. Hi, I'm Shane Coulter. I'm one of the family owners of Country Arbors Nursery and Coulter Nurseries. Uh, we're in Urbana, Illinois, in Onarg, Illinois, and we grow perennials, annuals, trees, and shrubs. So I know a little bit about uh, all those different plants. So anything that grows outdoors in the state of Illinois, I can pretty much handle. Wonderful. Don? I'm Don White. I'm an emeritus professor of plant pathology from the University of Illinois. While I was with the university, I taught introductory plant pathology to diseases of field crops and disease of ornamentals of turf grasses and did research on corn diseases with emphasis of genetic resistance. After I retired, I became a master gardener, which had been a lot of fun. And so we'll figure out what we can talk about whenever you call in. <laughs> you got something in there that we can talk yeah. about, right? All right, and Jim? Uh, I'm Jim Schuster. I'm a retired University of Illinois horticulturist and woody plant pathologist. Um, and I spent 42 years answering all these kind of calls and teaching master gardeners. Awesome, wonderful. Okay, so before we go into our show and tells, just to let you know again, we are live. So if you'd like to call in with your questions, that number is 217 333 3495. So, Shane, we're going to start with you. What'd you bring us? Uh, I brought us some succulents. And first of all, it's nice to be on with all these retired guys. A lot of free time, it sounds like, <laughs> on this know. panel tonight. So, but I brought a, brought a succulent in. And these are something that we did at the nursery. Uh, the girls had a little extra time and they put succulents in glasses and all these different utensils and things and made it really easy. I, have, I only had to water. I've had this sitting on my desk for probably eight months and I haven't had to get it hardly any water. I just put a little sprinkle of water, of water on it using a little spray bottle. It barely grows. It's slow. It's super easy and it looks really cute sitting on my desk. I'm not <laughs> a cutesy kind of guy, but, but I really like this and everybody that sees it really wants one and we've got them in like champagne glasses mm -hmm. and all different kind of bottles and they're really self-sufficient so when people ask for low maintenance these succulents are about as low maintenance as it gets very cool i like that idea of putting those this in is the a uh, glass from you know I, I think they found it at a garage sale or something yeah. like that so it's not very expensive either good introductory plant yeah. too as long as yeah, you yeah if you kill water. this we're going back to the rock pot <laughs> after that awesome okay so don you've got uh, some show and tell well yes. sort of show and tell item Yes, I do. I've got a bunch of slides. We'll start off with the slides. This is, uh, you might want to guess where this is. The <laughs> University of Illinois. No, I wasn't a student then. And <laughs> this is uh, in the 40s. You see they dressed a little differently. But look at the trees lined up. Next slide. Next. See the trees? Those are American elm. Now Dutch elm disease was a disease that was introduced from the Orient uh, by way of Europe and it got in the United States in the late 20s, spread by the elm bark beetle. Next slide. It, it, it was a vascular wilt, and the problem was it clogged up the xylem vessels that the plant died. Next slide. Yes. Here you can see the discoloration. The two on the, the center and the left side uh, are diseased. The one that's clean is not diseased. Next. Now this is the reason why the disease spread so fast. All those elms and rows were root grafted together. Mm. So you infect one tree and it spreads into xylem vessels from tree to tree to tree. We have another disease that's a problem. We also have uh, fusarium, or verticillium wilt. This is a verticillium wilt on a maple. Verticillium wilt has a very, very large uh, host range. Next. Cause of wilting in the plant. It also is a vascular wilt. Next. Deadly on red buds. Next. And here you can see the vascular discoloration. Now, the point here is as we look at replacing all the honey lo or all the uh, ash that have been killed off by the ash borer, do not plant big sets of, of materials that are susceptible to, to verticillium wilt. Okay? So, what you can do, there's lots of websites. You can look on plants that are resistant or Shane can tell you, and uh, don't put, and, and what you also want to do, you'd like to be able to distribute out different tree species, so you don't have all of one thing, so we won't have another catastrophe like we've had with uh, uh, recently. 
Yep. So is this something that we still see or has, or has this, have we? Oh, verticillium, yeah. yeah. We'll see verticillium. Still running. It, it loves Norway maple also. Oh. And it, it just takes a while to kill the plant. That's the reason why you may not hear about it as much. What are the first signs of it after uh, people? Poor growth, wilting, drops leaves early. I know one tree that's been diseased now for about 20 years and it's still not dead. Wow. It doesn't look like much of a tree. <laughs> and here we have a cross section on a maple tree. You can see the discoloration in the middle. And that's one of the easiest ways to tell if they bring you yep. a branch that's recent. You can literally cut it and see the circles yep. in it. So we can diagnose it pretty quickly on mm -hmm. the spot. And, and sometimes the uh, verticillium streaking is not brown. And on maples especially, it can be greenish looking or purplish oh. green. And it's in the soil. That's what people... Yeah. Once you've taken the tree out, putting another tree in is going to get the gonna. same disease. So. It'll so, remain okay. in the soil on roots that are still intact. The fungus goes dormant. It can stay there for years and years and years. I mean, that could get enormous, that project, because mm -hmm. uh, yeah. do you have to take all of that soil out? Yeah, uh, you're not going to be able to do anything. You just put a, uh, put a disease-resistant tree wow. in its spot. And, and, and a lot of people think that's a tree pump. Vertically, like you said, grows on herbaceous plants, mm -hmm. too. So you can't just say, well, I'm not going to plant trees. I'm going to go plant flowers. Sure. You got to make sure you get a verticillium resistant flower too. Interesting. Wow. That seems like a lot of work. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Don. All right, Jim, what did you bring? Well, I brought trees that were tied way too long when they were planted. Uh oh. People forgot to take the rope, wire, whatever off. And the recommendation is it's one year only. Okay. If for some reason your tree is not establishing, you should figure out why it's not. Because it should only take one whole growing season. But if you end up having to tie it for two or three years, you need to untie it after one year, retie it in a different location for the second year. Mm -hmm. Because if you, first of all, you don't want the rope or whatever you're using cutting. As, as the tree sways a little bit, it may sink in like saw. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I got nylon rope, I got old clothesline, wow. I got wire, and even the small wire. Now, these were all tied tight against the trunk. That's not recommended either. Okay. It, you should tie it to a stake and then loop it around the trunk of the tree. And that, because we do want the tree to bend a little bit mm -hmm. because that makes the trunk stronger. Mm -hmm. Not so much bending that we can watch the roots start heaving in the ground because that will prevent the tree from rooting in. But you want a little bit of a slack to allow the trunk to strengthen itself as it grows. And like I say, we, we all agree one year should do it if you have the right, you put the tree in the right growing site. Gotcha. Yikes. So. We've all seen these before though. Oh yeah. Uh, chains, like dog chains oh, yeah. I've seen, kind of absorbing into the tree, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I mean, people forget to take their stuff. I mean, sometimes it's a uh, swing they left on the tree branches, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you name it. The people forget that the tree keeps growing. Sometimes it does choking. Sometimes the tree tries to eat it. Yes. Um, wow. Yeah. There's okay. A whole thing. Don't recommend any of that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. And real quick, before we go on to questions, just to let you know, we are live and we would like to take some of your calls. So please give us a call, 217-333-3495. Okay. Shane, we're going to go back to you. Uh, Peggy in Springfield has a question about her hydrangeas. She's got two varieties in her garden. One blooms almost every summer. The other has not bloomed since the first year it was planted. All year long, she puts coffee grounds on there and generally in the fall feeds them with plant food for acid-loving plants. Never trim them back. Is it possible that one variety blooms on old wood while the other variety blooms on new wood? And do you have any other suggestions? All right, that's, uh, this is a question that we pretty much answer three to five times a year. Mm -hmm. I think people working yes. the cameras could probably answer yes. this question <laughs> that it's been asked so many times. But, but it's, let's, we can go to it. It's spring. That's the rite of passage. We talk about hydrangeas. She's right. There are hydrangeas that bloom on old wood, and they bloom on new wood. And if you leave it up to Mother Nature, then you're going to get what she gives. And so... A plant that blooms on only old wood, if it dies to the ground, then the flowers aren't going to come out. Some of the new hydrangeas are made to be old wood and new wood, but you can't trust that completely because it, it's not as easy as they say it is. 
there are a lot of hydrangeas out there. There's probably more hydrangeas out in, in the, the uh, yards than you've ever seen before. They'll probably, even at our nursery, we'll probably have 70 varieties of hydrangea this year. So that's where the professionals come in. When it comes to staking, choosing trees, how do I trim this hydrangea? Those are the questions you ask when you get to the nursery. And there's this awesome thing called Google that does a pretty good job if you ask <laughs> what the variety is and how do I trim it that you can probably answer that question. You just have to know when people ask me what they do, it's amazing what they don't even know what they're asking. They don't know the variety of plants. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to be an informed gardener, uh, keep some records of what you have and then you can make some good decisions on how to take care of them. So hydrangeas, there are different kinds. You just have to figure out which one it is. Figure out which one you've got. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right, Don, we're going to go to you. Christy has a question about an insect. Is this little fellow a friend or foe? Doesn't bite or sting or emit foul odors. He just basks in the heat of my reading lamp. One or more of these critters has appeared daily in my house since I bought the house plants that's, uh, that she had outdoors over the summer. So, friend or foe about this guy? It's a foe. That's a brown, more mar more rated uh, stink bug. You try to pick him up, it's going to secrete a, a odiferous material. It kind of helps it protect itself from lizards and things like that. These were introduced from the Orient. They got in, in uh, Pennsylvania, first reported in 98. They feed on all kinds of plant material. They've uh, been a real problem on vegetables and fruits and things like that, and they'll just cause a little nick in the uh, material where they suck out the nutrients. But we all know that we buy fruits and vegetables and whatnot on parents. So if they got dimples and things on them, people don't want to buy them. And this guy can smell. And what happens in the uh, fall of the year, it goes into hiding or it mm -hmm. goes into homes and places like that where it's protected. It can't tolerate our por uh, polar vortex. So then, and it's attracted to light. So if she wants to decide to pick these things up, she's gonna get her fingers stinky. Uh, if you get a lot of them and try to do them with a vacuum, it's gonna be a mess. Mm -hmm. We have them. They come. They love coming in the house oh, with yeah. the plants. My three-year-old calls them stinky bugs. So how do, you, well, how do you kill them? <laughs> That's the most important. How do you get rid of them? Well, one, you use, you know? uh, one thing is somebody that I know has used, they've, they've got a light that shines down on a big bucket of water that's got soap in it and the, the light attracts the bug. The bug falls down in the water, the soap breaks the su surface tension, and they drown. I don't know if you can hear them scream or not. <laughs> it, uh, it seems to work. They make traps, but they're expensive. Yeah. yeah. God, they're so annoying, though. Those bugs are such a nuisance. They're not a neem mm -hmm. oil or uh, insecticidal soap uh, doesn't do anything Not to that them. I, I don't know if you want to be spraying that around the house. No, in the house, <laughs> yeah, that's true. Okay. All right, Jim, we are back to you. Uh, okay. Linda sent this in on Facebook. Oh, you had yeah. another show and tell. Yeah, I, had I skipped ahead. Okay. <laughs> well, I've got powdery mildew, which okay. is a, and this is the time of year. I mean, as anyway. we start leafing out, especially like lilac, mm -hmm. it's very prone to this. Uh, powdery mildew is a surface fungus. It grows on top of the leaf. Can I help you? Most of the time. Yeah, please. Most of the time. However, and on some of the lilac leaves, it will penetrate the leaf and make the leaf slightly thicker. So if you feel this leaf over here and, it, and it's green mm -hmm. and doesn't have any mildew, it'll feel thinner than the one with mildew on the inside as mm -hmm. well as on the outside. You wait till you see this to spray this one. It, you don't spray preventively. But when you start seeing like a quarter size mm -hmm. white spot on one leaf, you spray the entire plant. If you got a rove plant of uh, lilac, for example, you spray all the lilacs gotcha. because it means the spores have already probably landed, just haven't grown yet. And I wanted to compare that one to black mildew. Okay. Black mildew is not that common, but it also grows on the surface of leaves. This happens to be on an evergreen, but it does grow on herbaceous plants also. Uh, you treat this one like you would the mildew. Wait till you start seeing it and then spray. And then I brought in sooty mold because I want to compare the black mold against sooty mold. Oh, now you're just getting yeah. too intense. Well, <laughs> the sooty mold doesn't grow on the leaf. It grows on honeydew. Ah, and honeydew, that's the waste. Yeah, and honeydew is the liquid fecal matter of <laughs> sucking insects. 
<laughs> so, so any mold will grow on concrete in your car, you if you stay there long enough. Anyway, it just likes plants that get real sticky from the honeydew or fecal matter of sucking insects. These you're going to use a fungicide on. Mm -hmm. This one you're going to use an insecticide to kill the sucking insect, whether that's a scale or the aphid. So treatable. They're all treatable, just a matter of when you treat. Now, can you tell these two um, just by looking? Uh, well, well, not you. Can yeah. a normal person, the average person? Well, you probably, <laughs> if you looked at these two, you won't see any shiny, sticky stuff around it. Gotcha. Okay. Where the sooty mole, if it hasn't yet grown there, you can see the sucking, I mean, the, uh, the uh, honeydew mm -hmm. sap. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, on the uh, leaf yet that hasn't gotten turned black and that. Gotcha. So, and if you felt it, this won't feel sticky. This may feel sticky when okay. it's fresh. Good to know. That way you can distinguish between right. the two. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. All right, we've got a call. Mike in Hammond has a question about compost. Mike, are you there? Yes, I am. Hi, go ahead. I have a question for Shane, I would believe, on garden compost. What would you recommend to put on my garden? I'd like to compost it with two to four inches of compost this spring to kind of lighten it up. Yeah, there's, there's lots of good uh, choices for compost. I'm a big fan of mushroom compost. The problem is they put mushroom, the word mushroom compost on a lot of different compost, but a true sense of a mushroom compost is actually from a mushroom factory where they've inoculated uh, different things and grown mushrooms and then they bulldoze it out or skid steer it out into a big pile and mix it with some kind of manure and then maybe a peat moss. So if you can find some kind of of uh, mushroom compost, that's really good. There are some cities that have some good leaf compost or waste compost. I know in Urbana, they do a real good job. Doesn't quite have the nutrients of the mushroom compost, but it's, it, you know, it's better than what you would get in a normal soil. But I would always start with mushroom compost. We do about a 25 to 30% mushroom compost to the rest uh, garden soil and mix that together. If you have some worm casting, that helps, but not all worm castings are treated the same either. We've noticed that people are cheating on the worm castings. <laughs> worm castings used to be with good grains and other good rich material, and I've watched them start to throw peat moss in there and make mm -hmm. fake worm castings. And you can tell by the weight how much you get. And I can't believe that I'm like the, the worm casting expert. I can feel it and how it feels, <laughs> but, but there is quality worm casting. So a little compost, some worm casting, some good black dirt. If you can get it, you'll have a really good garden. Anybody else have anything they want to throw in there? Okay. All right, we're going to go to Bill with a question about black ants. Bill, are you there? Uh, yes, I am. Hi, go ahead. Um, I've had this uh, problem with uh, black ants in my garden the last two or three years. They seem to just colonize in a certain area. I'm pretty much a, I'm an organic gardener. I don't want to, you know, throw a lot of stuff in my garden, but they really destroyed my beets last year. And I'm not sure how to remove them without destroying, you know, and messing up my ground where they're just going to move to another part of my garden or something I can do to get them out of there. I appreciate your call. Thank you so much. Well, I would first ask how big are the ants mm -hmm. because it may make a difference where they live because they're a huge, long one. There's probably a carpenter ant living mm -hmm. in a rotting tree. But all the ants I know of eat insects or meat. I never heard them going after a vegetable. So if you're finding them in your vegetable, I would think that you may have some insects on your vegetable that you need to worry about. Hmm. What about in general, I've always said that ants are a result of other things. Yeah. Yeah. That they're not actually causing the problems, they're right. just pointing them out. So I'm not the bug expert. That's what I tell everybody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've never heard of an ant eating a vegetable. Yeah, he I mean, said they got into the beets. Yeah. yeah. Something, there was something eating the beet that yeah, the Yeah, something opened up that beet to expose the sugars gotcha. yeah. to the ants. Okay, so find out what brought the ants, and then we'll go to that. All right, we've got another call. Brian about um, ask, has a question about spraying apple trees. Brian, are you there? Yes, I am. Hi, go ahead. Well, I've got about 10 apple trees, and every year I've got worms in my apples. So when do I start spraying the, before or after they bloom, and do I change uh, the sprays throughout the year? Well, if, they got, if you got a uh, scale on your tree, you're going to use a drum and oil, and then you wait till they're done blooming to spray your fungicides and insecticides. 
So you got actually got to have worms, worms in yeah. the apples. Yeah. Yeah. How do you time that? That's that's I a don't question. Know how do you I, time it? Yeah. I mean, I know with spraying with the fungus, you know, the unfurling of the leaves and that. But as far as getting the apples so that you don't get the worms, I'm not. I'm not really. Uh, and the problem is you can't use anything systemic because you're going to eat the apple. Yep. I mean, if you're looking at collie moth, which comes up into the core and then out the side, versus the apple maggot, which makes it lumpy and leaves little brown lines mm -hmm. through the thing, they take a little bit different control. So, and timing is different on them. So, um, we do need to know which one you actually have feeding on the apple, first of all. You know, uh, John Bonesteiner was here a couple weeks ago and said that he actually went out and put baggies over the apples. <laughs> all around the tree to protect them as they were growing. Yeah. So there's that. <laughs> okay, yeah. we're going to line to Tom uh, with a question about morels. Tom, go ahead. Yeah, thanks uh, for taking my call. Sure. I'm curious, when uh, morels come out, uh, what's, uh, what's the best place to find them, and have they been domesticated yet? So, Don, <laughs> hit him, hit him with the... <laughs> <laughs> no, they have not been domesticated yet, uh, and really the best mushroom is one that comes from a grocery store with a grocery store label. <laughs> There's a false morel, and I looked at those up, looked at the spore and whatnot, and it said that uh, they're possibly toxic, which I didn't particularly like. But anyway, uh, a lot of mushroom hunters, and they've got all kinds of ways to, to look for morels usually in the spring of the year. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, I mean, they must be pretty good because they have to blindfold me when they take me to their spot. <laughs> yeah. I know. To go hunt Nobody's given up those secrets. And they're always, it always yeah. seems to be a line. Just be careful and don't. Yeah. Well, they, they, they seem to know the morels. They don't hunt very many other. Mm -hmm. So the morel guys, they're very, they're, it's like a fishing hole. They won't <laughs> tell you where they go. They, <laughs> they blindfold you and take you out there. But it does tend to be limey soil, I've noticed, that mm -hmm. there's a certain type of soil, because I'm always trying to figure out where they've taken me to get <laughs> these mushrooms. <laughs> Maybe nobody else gets kidnapped and taken morel hunting. That might just be me. <laughs> All right, we're going to go to Sue Owen in Springfield uh, with a question about service tree, Downey service tree. Sue Owen, are you there? Yes, I am. Hi, go Hi. ahead. Um, an extension office person at a farmer's market locally in Springfield suggested last year I was looking for a smaller ornamental tree for my front yard, and they said I should look at a downy service dairy. But I've yet to see where I could purchase one, so I didn't know if the nurseries, Champaign or Banner, <laughs> Springfield area might have something like that. Yeah, I know, a, I know a place that has some. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me the old address. It answers. rhymes with country arbors. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, if you, you're really looking for a shrub that's been trimmed into a tree form, that's basically what the service berry is. is uh, we basically take one cutting. Naturally, it grows in multiple stems. Um, but when we want to grow a tree form, we grow one stem and we keep trimming it and make it one single stem. They're not the perfect straight tree that you might see in a maple but it, it is short like you're talking about. It can be 15 to 25 feet tall with a nice you know, nice head on it, probably 15 foot wide, 20 foot wide. But it has great spring blooms, nice fall color, and it is that ornamental tree. They're harder to find. It is something that's a little short in the market right now, but uh, if you go early in the spring, you can certainly catch some. And they're inch and a half trunks to two inches, probably a good size to start with. Okay, uh, we've got a couple minutes left. We're going to take one more call, Gigi, on line three, uh, with a question about an oak tree. Gigi, are you there? Yes, I am. Go ahead. Hi, I have several pin oak trees in my yard, and this past year, the acorns have been crazy. Is there anything you can treat the trees with to prevent acorns? A chainsaw. <laughs> yeah. There, there, there is Go actually right a... to the chase. <laughs> There's an, uh, and I can't remember the name. I know that we've just sold a bunch of packets of it and it works really well. You actually, the homeowner can drill it in, put it in and it aborts the yeah. fruit. If wow. you time it right when the flower is about to end, you know, in that flowering period and you put it into the tree, uh, it does a great job. Probably 70% of the acorn, it's not gonna make it completely fruitless, mm -hmm. but we use it for sweet gum and acorns or any kind of fruit that you wanna abort. Okay. Uh, they have other uh, things that you can spray on it, 
But it gets hard on a big tree to spray a giant tree, yes. so these inoculants are much better. And, and it's not as difficult as you think. And even the inoculants on a very large tree. Yeah. We're going to go to Diane real quick with a question about flowering crab tree wilt. Diane. Hi, I have two flowering, non-bearing, non-fruit bearing crab trees that had wilt and the leaves would fall early in the year. I had the injection into the roots done last year by a landscaper. Do I need to have that repeated this year? Is there, is there such thing as an injection to the roots for a... I know. Yeah, I nope. hate when that thing, those things like that happen. Yeah, that's not how you would treat it. There's no such thing as an injection. You have to be real careful yep. when you're dealing with lawn companies. And I'm not saying they're all like this, but they have a checklist of what they're going to do, and they treat for things that don't happen, like spraying for bagworms on maples. I hear these yeah. all these crazy things. Bagworms don't like maples. Anymore. Yeah, and they don't even like them. So your wilt is caused... During, and we need to spray it during that flowering period when the leaves are the same as the fruit trees. It's essentially the same type of thing. So it's a spray. You need the time. You'll have to check with us a little bit later on how to, to do that. Okay. Thank you so much, guys, for coming and sharing your expertise. And thank you so much for watching. We will see you next time. Have a good evening.